Hello, and a very, very warm welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. Delighted, of course, to have you on board, and thank you for stopping by. This is a wine educational channel designed to help those of you studying the world of wine, to get to grips with it, to comprehend it, and to get more from it, so you, of course, get maximum confidence as you go into your wine examinations. And this series is absolutely no, no difference. This is what we are calling the WSET Level 4 series. So this is your diploma on the wines of the world. That's the D3 section, the big one. And this is the Italy section called Northeast Italy, the part Northeast Italy within Italy. And we're focusing here, that picture, by the way, is of Aquilia, which is a beautiful Roman establishment. We're looking at Friuli Venezia Giulia here, which is our real northeasterly part of Italy. Uh, so we've already covered Trentino Alto Adige. We're moving across to the northeast. And Friuli Venezia Giulia is split into seven sections, seven parts. So part one and part two will be available as free content to everyone. But parts three through to seven will only be available as content on my e-learning portal. That's over at www.winewithjimmy.com. It's a portal designed really to give you huge amounts of resources to help you with your wine studies flashcards, written questions, but of course, many things like exclusive video content. If you have any comments, questions or concerns, please pop them underneath this video. Make sure you click like and subscribe, or you can utilize the social media that you see at the bottom of every slide. So let's rock and roll talking about the world of Friuli Venezia Giulia. So commonly, we just call this place Friuli. We don't normally do the whole mouthful of Friuli Venezia Giulia, uh, but it's Italy's most north easterly region, and it's known exceptionally well for its high quality premium whites, both varietal blended and also Maserato, Vino Maserato, so skin contact wines in this area. It's bordered by Austria to the north, Slovenia to the east, and its wine culture, therefore, very much reflects this connection from the German-speaking and Slavic countries. Uh, so lots of um, influences from those areas, which makes it a real diverse area in terms of wine culture. It's fantastic, amongst other things, linguistically, gastronomy, history. There's loads of things to get stuck into in this area. The um, map on the right hand side is the highlighted zone. The capital is Trieste. Uh, you can fly to Trieste. Uh, the airport is actually closer to Gorizia. Gorizia is uh, right on the border of Slovenia. Udine is here as well as a city in the central plain just to the foothills. So um, talking about the introduction to this area, it's responsible for about 4% of Italian wine production. And as I mentioned, it's focused on a quality white single varietal, but with some blended expressions as well. 75% of the production here is white. So of course, massively dominated by the likes of Pinot Grigio, Frullano, Chardonnay, Sauvignon, uh, and amongst others as well, like Verduzzo, amongst others. So yes, we've got a few reds in here as well. Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Refosco, Cabernet Sauvignon. But it is majorly its white wine production that we will be focusing on. Um, it's a mixture between um, indigenous or tungtonous varieties, things like uh, um, Refosco, Verduzzo, uh, and then a, quite a few international varieties are found in the mix here little bit about the history. So um, tribes would have cultivated vines here, but the importance really was when the civilization of the Romans moved through here. So they came through here in the second century BC through Aquileia. Well, they established Aquileia somewhere around 181 BC. Um, it became one of the most important cities to the Roman Empire, often uh, in populace, totaling very high in their top five. 
uh, but also in terms of commerce and trade. Today, it's um, a much more smaller historical city, uh, UNESCO sites, you name it, but um, historically larger and more important in the Roman Empire. Then we have um, a century later in 53 BC, Giulio Cesare founded Forum Giuliae. And Forum Giuliae is today what we call Cividale. Uh, and you can see uh, kind of where the name Friuli comes from. So Forum Giuliae is where apparently the name Friuli tends to derive from. Now, Giulio Cesare and his legionnaires transformed into peaceful colonists, giving a boost to the landscape here in terms of viticulture around the sunny hills of the Colli Orientali, the eastern hills that we call today. By the way, that picture is the gorgeous bridge that goes into Civedale, the beautiful, uh, the beautiful city at the foothills of Colli Orientali. Um, Friuli wines enjoyed many moments of great recognition in the ancient world. The Roman polymath and historian Pliny the Elder pictured, praised in one of his songs, the wine Pulin Pulenium, I suppose you would say. Pulenum is uh, my Latin is not good at all, but uh, please answers on a postcard for that. Most likely the ancestor of the Prosecco sparkling wine, apparently. Uh, and in the 18th century, most of the European courts had a taste for the wines made from the Piccoli grape, the grape that yields very small amounts crafted into sweet wines of the area. Historical records indicate that a certain Fabio Aschini exported in that period around 100,000 bottles of uh, of Piccoli wine in that year, which was quite amazing. Next up then, uh, we are talking really about what followed the aftermath of the Romans. Uh, and of course, this is after 476 AD. And we have influences from the Byzantines, which in fact is your, uh, your red color here. So this is the Eastern Roman Empire, otherwise known as the Byzantines. And you can see that parts of... Uh, of our landscape in Friuli uh, are, are, are covered there, but also the yellowy areas, which are the Lombards. Um, the Lombards actually made Civadale as their um, first Lombardian dukedom and actually became an important capital city for them. Uh, the Franks then shifted the power seat from Civadale to Aquileia because it was more religious and they were much more aligned with the Pope when they came through this area as well. So lots of different factions through the Dark Ages affecting this area into the Middle Ages. Then we have independent city states emerging, such as, of course, uh, Trieste, as you'd expect, because it is a maritime state, but then also Gorizia that you see in this picture. They emerged due to the Alpine Slavs or the Slovenes and later the Austrian Empire. Uh, Friuli later becomes a part of the Holy Roman Empire and then was split into two, the East and the West. So the Western part, which includes today the Western and Central part, were acquired by the quite powerful Maritime Republic of Venice. And then the eastern part, which is Gorizia, who you see pictured here, and Trieste was acquired by the Austrian Empire. By the end of the 18th century, the whole region became a part of the Austrian Empire. The western and central Friuli zones joined the Kingdom of Italy in 1866. That's uh, around the first few years of the Risorgimento. And the eastern parts joined at the end of World War One in 1919 to join the Kingdom of Italy after the success of the First World War. That brings me to an end of this first video, which in your text is actually only just a small paragraph, but I've given you a lot more information about the wonderful history of this area. Please do join me next for part two, which is another free content video on the growing environment and geology. As always, if you have any comments, questions or concerns, please do get in touch by commenting on this video below. Make sure you click like and you click 
subscribe. And of course, you can utilize all of the social media handles at the bottom of every slide if you are that way inclined. And of course, come and see me in one of my establishments here in the UK. Come and see me for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Ciao for now. Goodbye.